Good morning, Sovereign Grace family sitting at home. It is good to be together live. And by God's grace, we here at Sovereign Grace know that Jesus is risen. He is risen indeed. I look forward to an Easter where I can get that coming back at me again as we are shelter in place. Let's pray. Holy Father, pour out the Holy Spirit. And we know that you will. For you sent your son to suffer and to die for our sin in order to redeem us, to purchase us for yourself. And he did promise that as he goes away to the cross and dies and rises again, in a sense, he will send the Holy Spirit. So glorify him this morning and all we do on this glorious Resurrection Sunday. Amen and amen. The Apostle Paul writes, Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, he did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. And therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Let us worship our great risen Savior this morning. Upon thousands roaring song Singing praises to the slaughtered Lamb of God He is worthy All his people join from every tribe and tongue. He is worthy. He is worthy. Jesus, the Lamb upon the throne, sing the triumph. Praise to you alone. 
greatest mystery slain by death the god of life but no grave could e'er restrain him praise the lord he is alive what a foretaste of deliverance how unwavering our hope christ in power resurrected as we first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early, while it was still dark, and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. So Peter went out with the other disciple, and they were going toward the tomb. Both of them were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. And stooping to look in, he saw the linen cloths lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came, following him, and he went into the tomb. He saw the linen cloths lying there and the face cloth, which had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen cloths, but folded up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first, also went in, and he saw, and he believed. For as yet they did not understand the scripture, that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to their homes. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb, And as she wept, she stooped to look into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had lain, one at the head and one at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. Having said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing But she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Aramaic, Rabboni. Jesus said to her, Do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord and that he had said these things to her. Hail the day that Christ arose Through the skies to unknown glorious there he ever reigns object of all heaven's praise 
things, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, peace to you. But they were startled and frightened and thought they saw a spirit. And he said to them, why are you troubled? And why do doubts arise in your hearts? See my hands and feet, that it is I myself. Touch me and see. For a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. And when he said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while they still disbelieved for joy and were marveling, he said to them, have you anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of boiled fish, and he took it and ate it before them. Then he said to them, these are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures and said to them, Thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead, and that repentance for the forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all the nations beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. And behold, I am sending the promise of my Father upon you, but stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. Oh Lord, my rock and my Redeemer, greatest treasure of my longing. 
We are so thankful that you, in your mercy, saw fit to save wretched sinners such as us. We are so thankful that that plan didn't involve us trying to earn our way, for we would be lost. We would be dead in our transgressions. We would be dead to you. But in your perfect righteousness and your perfect mercy, your plan from the beginning of time was
Jesus to send your son who lived a perfect life, who lived the perfect righteous life that we could not live and who died the death that we deserved. Father, we thank you for your mercy and we thank you that your word is true and we can count on it that all your words are true and only true. So, Father, we pray that on this glorious Easter day as we celebrate new life through Jesus Christ, through his death and resurrection, Father, we pray that your Holy Spirit would invade our hearts and open up our ears to hear what you have for us from your word, your true and perfect word. Father, may you open up your word to us that we might hear it, that we might take it in and live. We ask this in your precious son, Jesus' name. So if you would, on this Easter morning, please turn to the gospel according to Luke. We'll be looking at the gospel according to Luke, verses 13 through 35. We're going to take a journey this morning on the road to Emmaus. Lord Jesus, on that night before your crucifixion, you promised your disciples and through them all of us that you would send the Holy Spirit. And that's why any of us here at Sovereign Grace believe and we are moment by moment desperate as Chris just prayed for your power to rise up that, that in these next 30, 40 minutes you cause our hearts to burn within us as we see the scripture, hear the scripture expounded. Oh, you are our only hope, Lord Jesus. For you did rise. And you're but the first. And thus is all of us Old or young or approaching death. Oh, you're everything to us. You're the treasure in the field. Oh, would you continue to do this work in your saints here in this church and throughout all your churches in the world today. Oh, overcome the barrier of this coronavirus and not meeting together but sitting in a bedroom or a kitchen table or a living room. Overcome it this morning with your people and fill these millions of homes through the word of God being preached to the glory of your holy name. Amen. And amen. Christianity is built upon the historical bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Christianity proclaims that God acted to save sinners from the future coming judgment. That every single one of us have sinned 
and we lay under condemnation. But God sent His Son as He foretold hundreds and hundreds of years before throughout the Old Testament Scripture and then sent Him to suffer and to die and to rise on the third day in order to bring eternal salvation, eternal forgiveness, eternal life, the promise of the life of God in the future resurrection of sinners who have been purchased by Jesus, who conquered death for us, and He will return. And whoever believes that message will be saved. That's the gospel. That, that's the meaning of the good news of what God has done in Jesus Christ. Now, how do we know that that's true? Great, great words. We Christians throughout the earth today are loving to say, He is risen. He is risen indeed. How do we know? Here's the Bible answer. God sent witnesses. He sent witnesses from Moses through all the Old Testament prophets proclaiming that resurrection. Proclaiming that he would send his son. Indeed, even David's son, according to the flesh. And that he would suffer and die for sins. And then rise from the dead. He sent those witnesses. And then Jesus came. And he suffered and died. And rose from the dead. And he picked I witnesses of his resurrection in order to testify that he truly has risen indeed. That's the Bible answer. And if you believe that, you will be saved. If you don't believe it, well, we're already, because of our sin, condemned. Now, Flash forward 20 years after the resurrection of Jesus on that Passover week. 20 years way far away from Jerusalem to Athens, Greece. Or it could be 300 years later in Britain. Or it could be 1,987 years later today. Flash forward, there's the Apostle Paul preaching to these philosophers, these pagans in Athens in Acts 17, 30 to 31. And he says, the times of ignorance God overlooked, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent. Because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he appointed. And of this, he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. Just contemplate what he just said. Every human being is now called to repent. And that this repentance, turning away from neglecting God to loving and worshiping Him, this repentance is crucial because, according to this text, God will judge the world through a human being, a man. And then the last words Paul said in that sermon was this. And of this, that he is coming, and there is a judgment, and he'll judge him through that man, Jesus. And of this, 
God has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. He's given assurance to everybody. Okay, you got to get this. He means to those Greeks in Athens, Greece, 20 years after Jesus rose from the dead. He means in Africa 300 years later, and he means in the South Bay area of Los Angeles 1,987 years later. He's given us assurance of this by raising him from the dead. So, w- w- wait a minute. How does that <laughs> work? I mean, I can see Mary. I've seen the Lord. Peter, John, Jesus' mom, his brother, later Paul. I haven't seen him. And those words ring through Peter's pen. Though you have not seen him, you love him. And though you do not now see him, you rejoice with a joy inexpressible filled with joy. I'm just going to say that experience. Hundreds of millions of us around the earth today. What I just quoted resonates precisely because what Paul is saying is true. God has given to them assurance. So biblically, how does it work? How how does Jesus' resurrection on that particular Sunday after Passover so long ago cause assurance in people today? Or 20 years over in Athens or Corinth? And the answer is God intended for the resurrection of Jesus to be known and believed through Human witnesses. There were no iPhones, video cameras, photographs back then. Because God did not want them to come into existence at that point. He didn't want them around for Jesus' resurrection. God saw to it, though, that there were many witnesses of his post-death transform human body on many, many, many different occasions over a period of 40 days so that all of those who were chosen as eyewitnesses would be fully convinced that their experience there was undeniable about a very unnatural <laughs> encounter with the man and the teacher and the rabbi that they loved so much so that they'd be so convinced they would tell others and they'd write it down for us to read and that witness then will spread as 2,000 years of history have documented it will spread throughout the whole world as valid assurance that this really happened. We just read Paul in Athens. Now there's another eyewitness to his resurrection. Peter. And when he preached in the Gentile home, six to eight years after the resurrection in Acts 10, starting with verse 40, he said this. But God raised him Jesus, on the third day, and made him to appear not to all the people, but to us who had been chosen by God as witnesses. Us, I, Peter, and name many, many, many more, us who ate. And drank with him after he rose from the dead. God's design in saving people was not that the risen Lord Jesus would be seen by everyone throughout the ages. 
Not even two months later. Or six years later. Or today. It wasn't his plan. As Luke writes in Acts of the Apostles, chapter 1, verse 3. And to the apostles whom he had chosen, he presented himself alive to them after his suffering. By many proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. Now, we, we know from the New Testament that even on one occasion where Jesus is most obviously teaching, 500 persons, even at one time. But the core, the apostles, which the ones he personally chose, an apostle means to be sent out as his personal emissary, as witnesses, the core, the 12, were to really bear witness and to tell it so that down through the years, a confused, depressed 19-year-old kid would pick up their testimony in his living room in El Segundo and start to read of Christ's suffering, death, and his glorious resurrection. And his life would be forever changed, assured that this happened. It's a long intro. That's what we have in Luke chapter 24. Luke grabs these testimonies and he grabs one particular one that we're going to look at. And so if you're there in Luke 24, we're going to begin at verse 13. But first, let's just lay, lay the backdrop up to this point of what Luke has given us. And that is this. Jesus was dead. Laid in a cave on Friday afternoon and then on early Sunday morning. Women who loved him so, his followers, they went to the tomb and the tomb was empty. And before they left, an angel appeared and said, he's not here. He has risen. And then they go back into town, into Jerusalem, to a place where a whole bunch of these disciples, the 11 and a whole bunch more, about 30 to 60 more disciples besides the 11, are hanging out, and they tell them what has happened. And for the most part, they don't believe. Who would? But Peter and John did run to the tomb. And they got there, and they looked in, and the body wasn't there, but they saw the wrappings of the grave clothes as if the body passed right through them because they're still lying there. And the face cloth and John believed. Okay, now here we are, verse 13. It's the same day. It's the Easter Sunday, and we read, that very day, that Sunday, two of them we're going to a village named Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. And they were talking with each other about all these things that had happened. Okay, now, the whole group of Jesus' disciples, they're in despair, depressed. The whole world has come crashing down. And these are two of them, non-apostles. Look back at verse 9 for a second. When the women, and re, returning from the tomb, they, the women, told all of these things to the 11 apostles and to all the rest. These two are part of all the rest. One of them is named Cleopas. So they either live permanently or they are staying. In Emmaus. And they're walking back. And they're overcome with grief. Their hopes of Jesus being the promised Messiah. Have been crushed. They knew Jesus personally. Jesus knows them personally. They're disciples of his. And then we pick up in verse 15. While they were talking and discussing together. Jesus drew near and 
went with them. But their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he, Jesus, said to them, What is this conversation that you are holding with each other as you walk? And they, just as we would have done if someone would have said that in that context, they stood still, looking sad. God had a plan. The Lord Jesus had a lesson to teach them, to teach all of us. It's no accident. This was going to be recorded for us. And because he had a particular lesson to teach these two disciples, and thus all of his disciples, Jesus in his immortal, transformed, resurrected body shows up alongside the road with them, and God acted. God caused them not to recognize, not yet, that this was indeed the Lord Jesus. He prevented them from knowing that, recognizing him. Why? That's how you got to read the Bible. Why? I don't know a better option than this. Because God didn't want them to recognize him. Yet, okay, okay, why? I read the rest of the passage and the answer is clear. Because he wants this conversation to happen the way it does. He wants it to continue. He wants the greatest biblical exegete, interpreter, and teacher to masterfully expound the scriptures. Jesus wanted to teach the extremely important lesson about trusting the written scriptures. And he does all this before he opens their eyes. Where they realize that was Jesus. And so Jesus says to them on the road, pick it up. You know, what what are you guys, what are you talking about And they stopped walking and had very depressed, downcast face. And then one of them, who's named Cleopas, answered him, Are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in this day? These Okay, they're shocked because this is crazy. This is like us today. Here we are filming live on Facebook because we're in shelter in place. And you walk down the street to go buy some food over there. Of course, it's takeout. And you're talking with your spouse about the coronavirus. And someone says, what are you talking about? The coronavirus. What is that? Is there a human being on earth who doesn't know about the coronavirus? Okay. And so, Jesus said to them, (laughs) what coronavirus? What things? Clearly because he wants them to emote. He wants them to lay it out. What things? And they said to him, concerning Jesus of Nazareth, a man who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word, Before God and all the people. And how our chief priest and rulers delivered him up to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it's it's now the third day since these things happened. And moreover, some women of our own company, our own group... They amazed us. They, they were at the tomb early in the morning. And when they did not find his body, they came back saying that they had even seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and they found it just as the women had said. But him, they did not 
see. They're depressed. They hoped that their teacher, that Jesus was the promised Messiah, the one to redeem Israel. But they basically say to this stranger on the road, our hopes are dashed. Don't you know what's happened? All the dots were not connecting for them yet, even with the testimony of the women and about what the angel said. These two disciples did not allow the Bible to change their worldview. They didn't allow the scripture to change their understanding of the promised Messiah. Not yet. It would have been us too. They had no theological category. They could have had a biblical category. But they had no theological category for the truth of how God was actually saving. And so these guys, they let out their pain and their dejection and their de- disappointment. And they're walking down the road. And that's exactly what Jesus wanted them to do. Jesus wanted them to... Feel it, emote it, talk about it with him. That's that's an easy conclusion. Because if he didn't want that, then he wouldn't have prevented them from recognizing him. I just want you to be joyful off the bat. But he prevented them from recognizing him. And he prevented them because this conversation was crucial, necessary for them. And through them, to all of his disciples throughout the centuries. Verse 25. Here's Jesus' response. And he said to them, Oh, foolish one. Okay, that's an interpretation. If it's too harsh, maybe go so. Oh, foolish dudes. <laughs> Slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Messiah, the Christ, should suffer these things? And enter into his glory. And beginning with Moses. And all the prophets. Jesus interpreted to them. In all the scriptures. The things concerning himself. This interjection. Oh foolish one purposely emotional to show his disappointment in the foolish failure of these two guys to read the Bible carefully and to believe it. See, at this point, they don't know this is Jesus. It's just a stranger to them. But all of a sudden, they've become all ears With this guy. Now. You see they certainly believe the prophets. Of course we believe the Bible. But they didn't really believe. All. The prophets. And all. That they have said. That's what Jesus. Is disappointed in. That's what his rebuke is about. Notice the word again, all, in verse 25. O foolish ones and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Much like us, they read the scripture, memorized scripture, 
quote scripture, had favorite passages of scripture, believe the scripture like us, selectively. Oh, they believed in the Messiah coming. They loved that part and that he would rule and reign as God has promised in the scriptures. On David's throne, conquer the enemies. All of this is scripture. They believed that part, but they ignored the passages that prophesied the Messiah's sufferings. Much like many of us or we're, probably all of us are doing it right now. We don't even know where, but we're so tempted as Christians to constantly do the same thing. Yes, we believe the Bible. Then we read that, that, that the Scripture tells us that God sovereignly and with no help of ours creates faith that saves inside of us. We, we read that new birth produces saving faith, and faith in Jesus does not cause new birth. We read about the, the depths of our sin nature, and that we are children of God's holy wrath. We, we read of God's divine election. And like them, we say, well, no, no. That can't really mean what it says. And so we leave that behind and we gravitate to those. We all agree on this one. Yes, Jesus rose. Thank God we agree on that as Christians. He rose from the dead. He, he, he's triumphant. We love this. He reigns. We love it selectively. But Jesus here calls them foolish people. Slow of heart. To believe all the Bible. And so Jesus starts with Genesis and moves his way through all the scriptures, pointing out through the stream of scripture how once and again and again it was constantly proclaiming and pointing to himself. Now, I loved my hermeneutics class under Dr. Fuller. But <laughs> this must have been extraordinary. The living word of God himself, incarnate, resurrected, stuck to the written word of God and explained it. He brought out the meaning that was already there on the page. That's the lesson. He wants to teach them and us. No wonder that same man, before he was killed, said in that story he told. Send! Send Lazarus! They'll, my brothers will believe if he comes back from the dead. Jesus said, no, they won't. If they don't believe Moses and the prophets, neither will they believe as someone rises from the dead. And so John, the Apostle John, throughout his, throughout his gospel, he's constantly making it crystal clear how Jesus' life and ministry were fulfillments of the Old Testament. As Jesus said here, he taught these guys, now walking on the road, scripture after scripture after scripture, do you see it now? Is there all along? See what's happened these last few days? They're all along. And early on in John 5, Jesus said this. You search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. And it is they, the scriptures, that bear witness of me. 
And yet you refuse to come to me in order that you may have life. That same conviction that, that the Old Testament scriptures as a whole were about Jesus of Nazareth is what drove the Apostle Paul constantly in his ministry, in his preaching, and in his teaching. Or as we saw a few weeks ago when he was before King Agrippa, he said it this way in Acts 26. I stand here testifying. Now, he's testifying about his own eyewitness account of Jesus' resurrection. That's not written in Scripture, Old Testament. That's what he's testifying to. But he says this, I stand here testifying both to small and to great, saying nothing but what the prophets and Moses said would come to pass. That the Christ must suffer And that by being the first to rise from the dead, he would proclaim light both to our people and to the Gentiles. And when Philip encountered the Ethiopian eunuch, and remember the eunuch, he's he's reading Isaiah chapter 53, verses 7 to 8. We know exactly where he's reading. And then he says to Philip, can you tell me who this is speaking of? Then Philip opened his mouth, and beginning with this scripture, not ending there, he went to more and more scriptures. Who knows how long he was there? But beginning with Isaiah 53, he told him the good news about Jesus. And then Peter, preaching in Cornelius' house, he says, And Jesus commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one appointed by God to be judge of the living and the dead. To him, all the prophets bear witness that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. So here's Jesus, just going to the written word of God, showing them. None of this should have been a surprise. It's all there before I ever came. It must have really been something, though, for these guys to hear the risen Lord Jesus. Though they didn't know it at this moment or for those at that hour or two, but to hear him explain all the scriptures concerning himself. Jesus' main thrust was to show them that the Old Testament, the Hebrew scriptures, were clear. That it was necessary for the Christ, for the Messiah, to scuff, suffer The scourging, the ridicule, the crucifixion before he would reign in glory. First century Jews, they latched on to the second part. The promise of the glorious, triumphant reign of the Messiah. But they failed to take into account that the redemption of God's people was going to happen through that same Messiah becoming the Lamb of God, pictured in the Old Testament sacrificial system. But think about these two brothers, man, for years to come, Cleopas, and why doesn't Luke give the other guy's name? I don't know. But they would be looking back, remembering how Jesus turned, quoted Genesis 3.15 and said to them, do you see? Do you see what happened a few days ago? Do you see that the crucifixion and the death 
was the way that he crushed Satan's head. For the Messiah was born of a woman. Or how Jesus pointed them to the ram that was caught in the thicket of the fence. And said, do you see how that ram was substituted in order to let Isaac go free? Or how he took him to the Passover in Exodus and the blood that is to be put on the doorpost and said, do you see how it points to God's true Passover in his Messiah, bloodied on the cross a few days ago. And then he goes on to the day of atonement and to the scapegoat and to the tabernacle and the sacrificial system and the high priesthood and on and on, showing them how they were pictures, shadows, and pointers to God's Christ. They became a human being, born of a woman, to crush Satan's head. Maybe he, he unfolded the images in Scripture that clearly spoke of him like the bronze serpent or the manna from heaven and he must have certainly gone to Isaiah 53, which is so crystal clear about his suffering and his death in verses 1 to 9, and then his resurrection in verses 10 to 12, where he again is satisfied and triumphs. Oh, he most certainly went to Psalm 22. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? This whole thing is just crystal clear about what happened a few days earlier on the cross and his resurrection at the end. He quotes to them Psalm 2 7. Yahweh said to me, You are my son. Today I have begotten you. Or to Psalm 110, verse 1. David proclaims prophetically. Yahweh said to my Adonai, my master, my Lord. He said to him, sit at my right hand. That's Yahweh talking. Until I make your enemies your footstool. Certainly Jesus, as he began his whole summary, don't you understand that the Messiah had to suffer first before Psalm 110. And so he shows him that the way to glory of this Christ was through suffering and death, making atonement for others, and then rising on the third day as he promised. And guys, you just told me, as the angels said to the women, the more this stranger on the road opened up the Bible, to them, the more their hearts burned, raced. This stranger, he established for them that the suffering and the death of their friend and their teacher, the one they hoped to be the Messiah, he established for them that his death was no obstacle to him being the Messiah. But in fact, it made Jesus of Nazareth claim to be Messiah all the more credible. The preached word, the expounded Bible, melted the confusion, the sadness. Bible came alive to them. They were believing the scriptures before they ever recognized that that was Jesus teaching them. Read on, verse 28. And they drew near to the village to which they were going. He, that's Jesus, acted as if he were going farther. But they urged him strongly, saying, no, Stay with us, for it's toward evening, and the day is now far spent. And so he went in to stay with them. When he was at table with them, he took the bread 
and blessed and broke it and gave it to them. And their eyes were opened and they recognized him. And he vanished from their sight. What a wonderful shock that that moment must have been and then forever buried into their experience for all eternity. <gasps> and then he was gone. And then listen to what they said. They said to each other, did not our hearts burn within us while he talked to us on the road? While he opened to us the scriptures hmm. to be a believer. Part of what being a believer is, is to daily seek the burning of your heart as the scriptures are open, read, discussed. Song, believe. Dear fellow Christian, we must constantly yearn to hate coldness of heart toward the Bible. Hate it when you wander. Hate indifference while you're reading. And we have a helper, a comforter, the Holy Spirit. Please break through my sinful flesh. Help my heart be pricked and love what it's saying. And therefore help me think through what it's saying. Read on. And they rose that same hour, still Sunday. And they returned to Jerusalem. I bet they got there in less than two hours now. <laughs> and they found the eleven and those who were with them gathered together saying, the, the Lord has risen indeed and has appeared to Simon. Then they, the two, told what hap had happened on the road and how he was known to them in the breaking of the bread. And so these two disciples, they get back to Jerusalem in overwhelming joy. And they're just itching to tell the apostles and all of the rest of the other disciples about what has happened. But as they arrived, they didn't get a word in. They started saying, Cleopas, and nameless guy, the Lord Jesus appeared to Peter. And they said, he's risen. And they go, we know. Let us tell you what just happened to us over the last few hours. And so by Sunday night, the apostles and all these other disciples, they're beginning to grasp the gravity of this wonderful reality and that they have been chosen for something much better than the fellowship of the ring this was becoming the fellowship of burning hearts of those who were being encountered by the resurrected Lord Jesus. And now, continuing over the next 40 days. And we can't close there. We must read what comes next. And so they're all thrilled. <coughs> He's appeared to Peter and to these guys. Next verse. 
as they were talking about these things, Jesus stood among them and said to them, Peace to you. But they were startled and frightened and thought they saw a spirit. And he said to them, Why are you troubled? And why do doubts arise in your hearts? Look, see my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Touch me and see. For a spirit does not have flesh and bones, as you see that I have. And when he had said this, then he began to show him his hands and his feet. Let that go on for a little bit. And then, while they still, this is a strange phrase, while they still disbelieved for joy, I mean, there, there is that. We do it all the time, don't we? You got me what gift? I can't believe it. Well, yeah, you can, but it, okay, you're just, and you got to check five times whether you got that toy or whatever. They disbelieved for joy. I just love this. And they're marveling at him. Jesus says to him, hey guys, you got anything to eat? And they gave him a piece of broiled fish. And he took it and he ate it before him. The fellowship of those who would be witnesses was being formed by the resurrected Lord Jesus it is those who will testify for all people everywhere down through the centuries that this Jesus has been truly raised indeed. As the Apostle Paul would say 20 years later in Athens, God has given assurance to all by raising Him from the dead. And thus appointing particular Chosen eyewitnesses. Jesus has risen indeed. And thus he is worthy. He is worthy of all blessing, honor, and glory. He indeed is worthy of this. Oh Lord Jesus, we thank you that you not only rose, but ascended on high, and you have poured out the Holy Spirit in order to go get those sinners who are yours, and given to you of the Father. Us as sovereign grace, as an example. We thank you. We thank you for the assurance by the power of the Holy Spirit in the word of the testimony of your eyewitnesses, you are truly worthy, O oh Lord. Be glorified. Amen. Well, we live in, in unsettling times with this coronavirus and all of this um, going on in this world. Um, several years ago, a dear, a dear friend of ours, um, was given the diagnosis that he had stage four lung cancer. And uh, when he came over to share that news with us, we were, of course, weeping. Um, and he, he said to us, my greatest problem is not my cancer. My greatest concern is not that. My greatest problem is my sinful nature, my sin. And that's been taken care of by my Lord and Savior at the cross. I'm okay. And he was comforting us with these words. And, and, and I just wanted to share, you, you, our greatest problem is not the coronavirus. 
Our greatest concern is not that. Our greatest problem is our sin. And that was taken care of at the cross. Once and for all. We have um, other promises in scripture. Um, in, in the revelation of Jesus Christ to John while he was on, on the island of Patmos. Part of Revelation 21. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. And the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them and they will be his people. And God himself will be with them as their God. And he will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. That promise is to those whose names are written in the book of life. Those who have trusted in the saving, saving work of Jesus Christ on the cross. We have that promise. And that is indeed great news. So. Is 
Is anyone whole? Is anyone able to break the seal and open the scroll? The Lion of Judah, who conquered the grave. He is David's root and the Lamb who died to ransom the slave. From every people and tribe, every nation and tongue, He has made us a kingdom and priest to God to reign with the Son. Is He worthy? Is He worthy of all blessing and honor and glory? Is He worthy? soul that is yours be overcome by the gospel implied by your Holy Spirit grasping the words that Jesus was raised for our justification so that if any believer there is struggling and doubting that their sin is been nailed to the cross, put out of the way between them and the Holy Creator, oh, let them, let us see and believe. For Holy Father, you are faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. For you cannot and will not ever deny your eternal son and the price he paid and confirming it and giving assurance to all who are yours by raising him from the dead. Hallelujah. Lord Jesus, you're worthy. Oh, it's so good to say And you know what? I guess I wasn't going to do this because this is so different not having a congregation in front of you. But we have a few of us here. So I will say he is risen. And you have microphones so that they can hear. He is risen indeed. Here we go. Our Lord Jesus is risen. He is risen indeed. He is risen. He is risen indeed. He is risen indeed. He is risen indeed. 
Amen. May the Lord of glory bless you and keep you and cause his face to shine upon you this coming week, giving you peace, filling you with his spirit, weaning you from this world, causing your hope in his resurrection and thus your resurrection in the future to drive your passions in your life all the more to the glory of Jesus. Amen.